welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the Madden America podcast. And this week, MIA correspondent Leah Harris interviews psychiatric survivor Dorothy Dundas. But just before we get to the interview, if you appreciate the rarely heard critical and social justice perspectives you hear on the Madden America podcast, please consider making a tax-deductible donation via our homepage at maddenamerica.com. Our work is made possible through the generous contributions of listeners like you. Thank you for listening and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Madden America podcast. My name is Leah Harris. I'm a political correspondent with Madden America, a psychiatric survivor activist, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dorothy Dundas. She's also a psychiatric survivor activist, a mother, a mentor, and an incredible supporter of activists in all of our movement building work going back several decades. And so it's just such, such a pleasure to have you on the podcast, Dorothy. Welcome. Thanks, Leah. So I thought we would just get right into it, um, and I would love it if you could tell the listeners, um, just share with them a little bit of the story of how you found this movement, how you got involved, and, and how did it all sort of get started? Well, it's really, it's really interesting because back when I was married in 1978, and I had four children, and my husband at the time was a psychiatrist. And he said, well, come to a meeting with me. There's a psychiatric meeting downtown in Boston, and you might be interested. So I went with him to the meeting, only I never actually got to the meeting because in the lobby, right by the stairs, there was a sign that with an arrow pointing down to the basement saying, Judy Chamberlain reading from her new book, Behind Locked Doors. And I thought, well, gosh that sounds interesting. And so I went downstairs and lo and behold, I never heard of Judy Chamberlain in my life, but there she was in a little room reading from her brand new book, which had just been published behind locked doors. And I was just completely amazed. There started. So after I did her thing, went back upstairs, told my husband, my life is completely changed. I then, she said, well, come to a meeting. She said, come to a meeting Monday night. We meet every Monday night. So Monday night, I went, I forget where the first meeting was, but I went somewhere in Cambridge. Every other Monday, Dan Fisher was there. Judy was there. David Oakes was there. A couple of other people um, whose names I no longer remember so long ago, but I've kept up with David. I've kept up with Dan all these years. I mean, that was literally 1978. That's how it started. Um, thank you. I was going to say, uh, just to back up just a second, for listeners who may not be familiar with uh, the work of Judy Chamberlain, uh, she was also sort of one of the sort of early folks who got engaged in trying to radically remake the system, right? And she wrote this incredible book called On Our Own. So basically, you heard Judy. And what was it that you heard that she had to say that just kind of undid you or sort of made you think about things in an entirely different way? Well, it was interesting. It's not that I hadn't been thinking about things. I had been thinking about things since December 4th, 1960, when I was first locked up, I had never stopped thinking, what is happening to me? This is the most horrible thing. When I get out, good Lord, I'm going to change things. I'm going to try to change things. So I finally got out in 63, but, but even though I, I had four children, I was raising my four children, then I, I always thought about it. And there was never a day that went by that I wasn't, it was not, it was like a, in the background of my mind all the time. So that when I met her, I was thinking, oh my gosh, this happened to her too. This is completely amazing. I have found my family. I have found my family of people who've been through what I've been through. And it was like, that was the most thrilling thing of all. To think that there were actually out there people like me. Yeah, I, because in my regular life, I just wasn't meeting people like who'd been through what I'd been through, and I really didn't talk about it very much because people didn't like hearing about it. <laughs> and so then, then that started me writing 
article for the Boston Herald and the Boston Globe. I would write op-ed pieces for the Boston Globe. I got completely obsessed with telling my story. And I, and I would just, this was way before cell phones, way before. I mean, I, I had a typewriter and carbon paper. And I would, you know, the trick of my baby is Matthew at the time. He was like a baby, you know, crawling around underneath my feet. And uh, he was actually two at that time. But he was playing around under my feet, you know, with his toys while I'm basically typing on the typewriter to my story with the carbon paper. And then I would put it in an envelope, put him in his car seat, and drive it down to the Boston Globe and leave it off. And, I mean, you know, I, be, I just became obsessed with that, and I had maybe three or four articles published and wrote many, many, many letters to the editor. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think I love this story because I think we're so, uh, we sort of take for granted this age of social media where it's, it's so easy uh, to share our story in a whole variety of different ways and kind of like really appreciating, you know, the effort that it used to take to, to get those stories out. And so what is it that kind of propelled you towards telling your story and what did it do for you to, to be able to express and to be heard in that way? I was propelled just by the sheer horror of what happened. Just, just always, you know, I always knew I needed to tell my story. But it wasn't really until I met Judy and met with those people on Monday nights that I felt com- completely compelled. And and I, I don't know. All I know is that it made a huge difference in in me in that I... I spent a lot of time choosing every word. It sends it all out there. And the first article I wrote, I was still married. I did not put my name on it. I simply said mother of four from Newton, Massachusetts or whatever. And the Globe was okay with that. But then the next one I wrote, I was already divorced or certainly separated by six months later or something. Clearly, I needed to put my name on it. And so at that point, I was extremely comfortable with putting my name. And uh, and I heard that from a lot of people. I just, it was, the, the purpose was to try to keep it from happening to somebody else. I mean, I think the main purpose, in addition to my poster also, is if this can save one life, it's all have been, it will all have been worth it. If every... Everybody, if a life can be saved by reading one of those op-ed pieces or one of those letters to the editor, then that will be good. It's all, the purpose of the whole thing is to educate people and to prevent it from happening. Yeah, from happening. That's, that's the purpose. Thank you. And we will definitely get to your poster. Um, but before we uh, wind up there, if you could share for, uh, for the listeners, um, just a sort of capsule version of, of what it is that, that you did experience and that story that you did need to tell and how that factored into your work as a writer, as an activist, and as an artist. Well, I think the details are actually pretty horrifying. They're still horrifying to me. You know, I take a small overdose when I'm 19. My boyfriend and just left me, and I... You know, I took maybe half a bottle of aspirin, told my parents that set in motion. It was not a real suicide attempt because I told them immediately, went to the hospital. From that point on, remember, it was 1960. I got put in the Mass General. Within three or four days, they transferred me to Ballpage Hospital, which is a very small hospital in Massachusetts, where I was petrified. And immediately, because I didn't talk, um, they diagnosed, diagnosed me with being schizophrenic and uh, gave me insulin and shock without any anesthesia, which basically meant they put you on a bed, they wake you up at six o'clock in the morning in the pitch dark in December, freezing cold. And I was there as like one of One, there were four girls, all of us teenagers, in beds right next to each other. And they would, one at a time, we would first get an insulin injection, 
which was supposed to put us in a coma, but it didn't always do that. It was very slow in doing that. So by the time they came around with the ECT, the guy would come in the room. He was wearing a black suit. He had a little black suitcase. And in that little suitcase, he would open the suitcase, and there would be the ECT machine. And they, he, would, he would stick the electrodes on my two temples, and uh, then, then they would say, is everybody ready? Meaning, is, are all the nurses holding, holding my legs down and holding my arms down? So when I had a seizure, I wouldn't jump up off the bed. But they were not talking to me, is anybody ready? I mean, is everybody ready? Of course, I couldn't speak. I mean, I was like paralyzed with fear. And then one of those mornings, my little roommate, Suzanne Kelly, Susan Kelly, she died in the bed from that. And, uh, you know, for a long time, yeah, I was just plain hard time. So, I mean, I think the fact that she died also is what propels me into telling my story, making sure that if we can save a life, because her life was lost right beside me, and any of us, any of us could have died from that. Any of us. And uh, it, was, it was really, really, really awful. I mean, every single, we did it for six weeks, Monday through Friday for six weeks, and every single day I thought I would die. But here I am. I didn't die. Yeah, and you, you made it out. And not only I, did you make it out to tell your own story, but I know that um, part of your story is to, to, to speak for those who can no longer speak, people like Susan. Uh, yeah. who, who, who died as a result of, of these horrific, uh, horrific quote unquote treatments, which we all know are not treatment, but torture. Torture. How do you even begin to rebuild your life? So before you kind of find this, this movement and, and you find your people, how is it that you're able to begin, even begin to rebuild? After my parents were told at Bobby that they couldn't do anything more for me they sent me to the Manier Clinic in Kansas where I was put on a teenage ward. Um, everybody was locked up. There were probably 12 or 15 of us all locked up. And I, and I, there, they put me on masses of Thorazine so I could hardly move. I mean, I, my tongue swelled up, couldn't talk. It was like just way too 400 milligrams of Thorazine. I mean, I, it was, I just, it was terrible. And I, I uh, witnessed people, I witnessed a young woman who had a baby and they'd taken her baby away from her in Argentina and sent her there and they would put her in cold packs and she'd be screaming for her baby from this cold pack. I could hear her screaming for her baby. I mean, so there's that. And from there, they said they couldn't help me anymore. They sent me to the Mass Mental Health Center in Boston where they took me off all the medication because they didn't believe in it, which was a good thing. So I had probably a year of Thorazine and then I was taken off when I got there. What was the sort of time span, you know, from, from the moment uh, you attempted to take your own life until you kind of went through that whole cycle of shock and Thorazine and then off Thorazine? December, 1960. And I got out in, Mid January, late January, sixty three. So that's two years, two full years. And I remember you and I were talking because my father was in the Menninger Clinic around oh, yes. the same time, and we we were yes. trying to figure out if the two of you were in there at the same time. But I don't. Yes. I don't we didn't. We never quite figured that out. No, because well, I know when I was there it would have been April sixty one for about eight months, starting April 61, for about eight months. And then I, then they said they, they couldn't do anything more for me. Everybody kept saying, we can't do anything more for her. Mostly because my behavior, I was so furious at being there that, you know, I would stop eating and I was, I was like basically objecting to everything that happened. I was like really angry, really objecting, not playing by any of their rules. And therefore, you know, they would say they couldn't help me anymore. And I think, honestly, the fact that I had so much anger is partly what saved me. Because there were a lot of kids there who became completely mute and never said a word. 
And I'm not sure if they were saved. You know, I don't know. I don't know if I was never able to reach any of them afterwards. Um, but anyway, then I went to meet them. Then I, many of them, then Max Mendel said they couldn't help me anymore. And so I was then sent to West Coast State Hospital, which was like the end of the line. And there I saw these elderly women tied to the chairs and they were like urinating on the floor, tied to their chairs. And they were what looked to me to be very old. But then, you know, I was 21. So maybe, maybe they were 40 or 50, but they just looked really old to me. They looked like they'd been there forever and they might have been there forever. It was that, and that was really shocking. And then I just need to tell you how I got out, which is a friend who was at Harvard Law School who had been locked up with me at Mass Medical Health Center. His name was Bob Juiced. And he would he's no longer living, but he would be happy to have his name here. Bob Juiced was at Harvard Medical School, and every time he got halfway through the third year of, of, of law school, he would end up at Mass Medical Health Center. He would get very manic, and they would lock him up, and so... I made friends with him three times because I was there every time he he kept coming by back and I kept still being there. And so when he finally got out, he would come and visit me at at Westboro every afternoon. He would leave law school and come back and visit, drive an hour out there and visit me. And then he finally went to my parents and he said, if you don't get her out of here, I will get custody of her and sign her out because she's going to die in there. She's never going to get out unless we take her out. And so he finally, basically he convinced my parents to sign me out. And that's how I finally got out. And then to answer your question about how I then managed, you know, when I got out, it was really, really hard. Because I was kind of a shadow. I was a, a shadow of my former self. I've done really well in high school. And um, I've been very, you know, social and very, I went to a very rigorous high school where I did, as I said, I did well. But my brain was really, really um, crushed by those ECTs. And my whole I think my whole self was kind of flattened, just flat as a pancake by the whole experience. And so I was just took baby steps, you know, teeny, weeny, weeny little baby steps, which is probably why I love that movie called What About Bob, where he's talking about baby steps. I loved that movie. And, you know, he was talking about baby steps, baby steps, and he would carry his little... He would carry a fish around his neck, a little, little. I think he had a little fish that he carried around his neck and a little, little envelope full of water or something. Anyway, I did. I took baby steps, and I, I had in order to get out of Westboro, I had to promise my parents in front of the superintendent that I would go to secretarial school. And at that point, you know, I would have done anything to get out. So. I promised I would go to secretarial school. So I went to secretarial school every Monday through Friday and learned to type 120 words a minute. But I'll tell you what, as I said, I would have done anything to get out and that I had to promise it. And so I knew I probably shouldn't run away again because they would probably lock me up again and I would never get out. So, so I like, I, I like, I went, (laughs) I went, I became a typist with, Helped me writing my, <laughs> that really helped me a lot because then when I was writing my op-ed pieces on the typewriter, I could type really fast. So it all, um, it all, it all ended up working out in your favor. Exactly, exactly. And then I finally got an apartment with, I don't even know how I found these people back there. There's no social media, but I found enough people to have an apartment. Oh, I know. I found two people they have an apartment with through the Hickok Secretarial School. They've been sent there by their parents or something. They no one had been locked up in there, but they were willing to to share an apartment with me. And then one day, I don't know, part of the conversation I brought up around dinner one night in the apartment that I had been in a mental hospital and one of my roommates packed her bags and left that night and never came back. 
she wow. she was so petrified of what I had said and so scared of me and what I might do, which of course is crazy. Um, so that was that was really interesting to me. I mean, I, I, my feelings were hurt, but I was mostly kind of what, you know, I was kind of not quite believing it. You know who you are, you know, and then as yeah. soon as people hear, you know, psychiatric hospital, they think you're going to take out a hatchet in the middle of the night or something. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I think and that's the society we live in, right? And we, and yeah. we still are and dealing with those kinds of, of stereotypes. Exactly. Anyway, after I, after I got out of secretarial school, I, I got a job at the, at the Peter Brent Brigham Hospital, which is now Brigham and Women's Hospital, being a secretary there for the, you know, a professor of surgery. And that was interesting. I learned a lot. I learned a lot typing his letters, typed his letters all day long, and um, learned that smoking was bad for you because he was writing the first early letters about smoking, about cutting into people's lungs and seeing that they were completely black from their cigarette smoking. And it wasn't long after that that I actually stopped smoking because of those letters that I had typed for him. It was just really hard at the beginning. But after I'd been out probably for about a year, I got my feet underneath me and, um, I don't know, moved into an apartment by myself, met the guy across the hall, we got married. About a year later, we got married, and the rest, you know, then I had four children, and I went back to college. I had a really, really great psychiatrist that I had found at Mass Mental Health Center, like, the day before they transferred me to, to uh, Westboro. And he had told me, you don't belong in Westboro. There's nothing the matter with you. And I said, well, they're going to send me there. They're going to send me there because I'm not behaving. I'm refusing to make my bed, and I'm so mad at them. And he said, well, you don't belong there. There's nothing the matter with you. Your behavior is caused by the, by how badly they've treated you in these places. It's like, yeah, there's nothing the matter. And so I remembered him. I remembered his name, and I found him. And he's the one who eventually helped me get my records. I saw him once a week or once every few weeks or whatever, just to kind of check in. He, and when I, whenever I have any baby, he comes to the hospital and see the baby and sees me and the baby, and he was, he was just great. I've been trying to get my records. I couldn't get them from anywhere. Nobody would answer any of my emails. Not emails, no. It wasn't email. It was letters back then. And um, never hear back from anybody. Finally, he... Because he was commissioner of mental health in Massachusetts, he then decided he would go to, you know, write a letter to the Baltate Hospital on his fancy stationery and say he wanted to go out there and have a meeting and, and see my hospital records with me. And they, they agreed because how could they not? He was the commissioner. He had, they had to agree. So I went out there with him and we read the records and he knew ahead of time that I was bringing a briefcase with me. And I said to him on the way out, I said, you know, I'm going to steal these things. He said, that's okay. That's okay. You can steal them. But then when we got there and I read them, he, he would, first I would read a page and then he, and I would pass it over to him. He would, so we read the entire thing, starting with me, passing over to him. And about, you know, two thirds of the way through, he said, now I'm going to go to the bathroom, do whatever you want to do. But because he'd been so sweet all those years, he'd just been the kindest, kindest guy. I knew that he, if I stole them all, he would get into trouble, and that probably wasn't going to be a good thing for him. So I kind of just stole every other page. I, I kind of read them, picked the worst pages, and stole every other one. Those are the worst pages. So the people who ran the institution, they were so stupid they didn't even realize. And so we had something to give back to them that was considerably lighter than what we had had, but nobody said a word, and I went off with what I had. And then I put them in, 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 in a box on my closet. So that was like, say, 79 or 78 or 80. So I also had this incredible desire several years after the fact to obtain my records. Um, yeah. I could not obtain 
all of them because one of the hospitals, or it was a private psychiatric chain called Charter Behavioral Health, they went under because several kids had died uh, oh. un- under their quote unquote care. So I couldn't act- get my records from them, but I did manage to get all the every record that I could get of mine and of my mother's. So people who haven't had this experience, I want to back up. Because the thing is, you know, this is something that my friend Chaku Mathai has said, which is, I got out of the hospital, but I'm still working on getting the hospital out of me, right? And I think part of that process of getting the hospital out of you is being able to see, at least for me, was to be able to see those records, to see what they said about me, and to really be able to to understand it on a deeper level. Um, So I want to kind of hear, like, what was that for you? What was that drive to, to get a hold of those records, like, you know, why not just, hey, I'm just going to put this behind me? I felt that they were me. I literally felt they were part of me. And I, and I, I just can't even describe it to you. Without those records, without me being able to see those things, that I knew they had said things about me that were terrible. And I had to be able to see them and kind of see them in print. I, I don't know. I felt they were part of me. I felt like those records belong to me. They are part of me. as the best way I can describe it. And when I read that, and mind you, I only read the one from Balti Hospital where I had the shock. In other words, I was never able to get them from anywhere else at all. Nothing from Manningers. Just this tiny little stupid little, you know, short version. Nothing. So... But the worst language, I think, really was um, what I what I put into the poster, and um, it was it was, and it was why I love the poster. I love my poster. I love selling it. I love giving it away. I love looking at it. I love everything about it. Well, tell us the story of your poster. What was the con- the political context for it? Sort of, how did that poster? come into to being? It came into being because in 1991, I happened to be watching television, the Anita Hill hearings, and I was so horrified by how poorly she was being treated that it just, I went up into my closet, on the shelf in my closet, I got out my hospital records, and in the course of, I think, the two or three days that, that I was watching TV, when they were doing the hearings, I would look at the records, pick the pages I wanted to take, uh, make copies of. Because back in those days, you had to go to the copy shop and they make copies for you while you stood there or you left them there and you came back. And I make copies so that I would have duplicates of everything. And then I knew, I just had a vision of what I wanted. I knew exactly what I wanted. I wanted a poster. I wanted to make it as true to life as possible with as many bad things in it, with as, with also a little bit of the hospital, of, of the op-eds that I'd written at the bottom. And I wanted the names at the bottom of the people who had died. And, and I just, I was propelled that particular moment by Anita Hill and how poorly she'd been treated. So she was, you know, those hearings, and of course, when, Ka- when I listened to the Kavanaugh hearing, I had the same feeling. My poster was already made, but I mean, I had the same feelings during the Kavanaugh hearings. What in the world are they putting that woman through? That is just plain disgusting. I, I so appreciate what you say about anger, especially as female-identified people in society, as women, our anger is such so often pathologized as something that is abnormal, you know, but I, I love your story because you talk about how anger actually probably helps you get out of the hospital. Right. And that, yeah. and that anger uh, sort of helps you to continue to sustain yourself, even in the face of, of how that, how that trauma plays out even long after we're out of the hospital. But it, it sounds like for you, that anger was a bit of an, an antidote to that trauma and a way for you to claim your power back. Yes, I think it was. I think it totally was. Even though every time I expressed the anger when I was locked up, I would be given IV Thorazine. So it wasn't allowed to last very long, but I thought I would end up on a mattress with no sheet or anything in a, in a locked room. 
completely cashed out from an IV Thorazine. But still, I kept being angry because I was angry because they had locked me up against my will and did done these terrible things. And so what was I going to do? I, I still am speechless when I think about it. Incredible that with everything that they did to you, it, it, it didn't sort of put you into a place of sort of resignation, right? Because I, I remember when I was when I was locked up, even with young people, other young people, so so many of them had already sort of given up, um, and which is really easy to do because of all the disempowering messages and the things that that happened to you in those places. Um, and so I just want to say I'm so grateful for your anger, and I'm so grateful how, that you were able to channel it into this incredible piece of art um, that, that people can, can contact you. We'll get your contact information at the end and, and they can get their own copy of your poster because you are distributing these, correct? I am. I am. I, I, I've been asking people to basically to donate $25 and then I send them anywhere from one to 10, however many they want. And that pretty much covers the cost of the tubes and the postage. Um, or, or I've been sending 10 at a time out to places like Mind Freedom, and then they just give them away. If people don't have money, I'm happy to have them pay the postage up to, you know, through PayPal, and then, and then I send them a free poster. But uh, what I also wanted to say was I learned a lot from a woman called Mrs. Lizer, who is obviously long since died, because she was quite elderly, even though she was on the teenage ward. I don't know why she was on the teenage ward, but there she was. And every single day, she w- they would give her her breakfast tray or her lunch tray or her dinner tray. And she would come out of her room and she would march down towards the nurse's station and she would take her tray and she would turn it upside down and dump it all over the floor and shriek and scream and say she was not going to stay there a day longer. She was not going to eat a single bite of their food. And you know what? I learned a lot from watching that. She, I had no idea how long she was there. She was there the whole time I was there, which is about eight months, but she'd probably been there longer, much longer. And there she was expressing her rage. Yeah. I learned right. It's like she was, she was a model of resistance. She was yeah. a model of resistance. And yeah, none of the other teenagers did that. But she did, and she wasn't afraid of anything. I wasn't afraid of them, but I wasn't. That's also where I took a cigarette and I burned a hole in my arm with a cigarette. That was my particular resistance. (laughs) That was my particular form of resistance. And every time they would take the cigarette away, I would get one from somebody else and continue the burning. It wasn't such a healthy thing to do. On the other hand, it helped me feel better. And it makes so much sense um, because, you know, you're in a place where obviously any outward expression of anger is going to get you drugged up and harmed even more. So it makes sense that then you're sort of turning it toward yourself, right? Yes. I want to kind of come back to this resistance and this activism for a moment, if we can. Um, Yeah. Going back to that early connection that you had with Dan Fisher and David Oakes and Judy Chamberlain, tell us a little bit about how did, what was the work that you all were doing together? What was the activism that you were doing? What kind of campaigns were you involved in? I know you were writing letters on your own and kind of being involved in media activism, but I'd love to hear more about kind of what those times were like. What were your meetings like? What did you, how did you decide what you were going to do and how did you go about doing it? The biggest thing about the meetings was the camaraderie and the support we got from each other just simply being together. We would usually have, we would, We'd, I would have, we'd be at Dan's house or we would have be at Judy's house or we would be at my house or every now and then we would be at the um, Brooks house at Harvard, which we got through David Oaks. And it was mostly talking. I remember we were trying to start, uh, you know, a house, a safe house, which is similar to is now, there aren't very many across the country, but similar to what they had in Northampton, similar to, I forget, there's one in New York State, I think. Basically, a house run by run by survivors without any medical personnel, just safe places to go. We were rested houses, whatever you want to call it. 
we were trying to start one of those and we got, frankly, we just never succeeded. And so, yeah, we never succeeded. And I'm thinking that's mostly what I remember about those meetings. They were just basically emotionally supportive because it was before I ever heard of alternatives. You know, after a while, I kind of stopped going to those meetings because when I became a single parent, sort of partway into those meetings, I then really decided I needed to dedicate every single minute to my children. The children took a lot of physical and emotional attention and dedication. And I and it was the same kind of dedication that, that I needed to be involved as an activist. And I, I found it hard to do both at the same time when the children were very young. And so I dropped out for a while and uh, didn't start coming back until my kids were more grown. And they were teenagers at that point and even in their early 20s. It makes so much sense. And but yet you've always stayed connected um, in, in some way, I think, to the movement. Something that I know about you is that Yes, you spent, you know, all this time, you know, really focused on raising your children to be uh, wonderful, be the wonderful, empowered adults that they are. I know several of them personally, but um, you never had a job in this world. I started off doing activism and, you know, what I did for my work had nothing to do with psychiatric survivorship or, or any of the other sort of system changing work that we're trying to do. Um, and then, you know, a lot of folks end up getting hired, either hired, you know, as part of the system or hired as some kind of an alternative to the system, right? But it does sort of change what you're able to do sometimes because you're connected to an organization. There may be things you can't say or, you know, you're worried about saying them. So do you feel like never actually having a job in the movement gave you more freedom to express yourself however you needed to and not sort of hold back or, or, or sort of toe any kind of line? Well, I'll tell you, in terms of jobs, even though I've never had a job within the movement, I have had plenty of jobs in my life. One thing I learned from Lee Mock very, very early on, Lee Mock is the name of the guy who, who I mentioned before who took me to get my records, He told me long ago, when I filled out a form, I needed to not check the box. Have you ever been in a psychiatric hospital? I applied for a job. I checked that box. Of course, I didn't get the job. So when I told him that, he said, you cannot check that box. I said, well, what what is a lie? I've been in these places. He said, that's a little white lie that's important for you to tell. I will support you 100% to lie about that because you won't get a job if you tell the truth. So I, I taught kindergarten in the Boston public schools when I finally got out of college. And there was that box when I applied for that job and I didn't check the box and I got the job and I taught in the Boston public school for two years, kindergarten. And then I had just basically when I was raising my kids, I did daycare for other people's children so I could stay home with my kids. And then I eventually had my own business where I could be my own boss, you know, with the driving business. For 30 years, I drove a taxi business, which is similar to what Uber does now, only it was all, call me on the telephone or page me on my pager way before cell phones. Um, But I never wanted to work in the movement. Yeah, I just never wanted to do that. I just didn't. I'm not sure exactly. I just knew that I would feel constrained and I could not be constrained. I'd had enough of that. Yeah. And so, but every now and then I think, boy, I sure do need money. Maybe I could go get a job doing something in the movement. And I think, wait, wait, don't, don't. In your story, I'm so struck. And this is also something that I really recognize in my own story is, it's almost a sort of magical synchronicity where people showed up for you at the right time, you know, and sort of helped you to escape and helped you to access your records and, you know, gave you that kind of advice to just, yeah, can you maybe keep your hospital history on the down low because they don't need to know. Um, All of these, all of these people who were able to sort of support you to, to have the kind of life that you wanted to have. Um, And so when I think about you, 
I think about how you are so much that person for others, especially folks in our movement and especially younger people. I mean, and I can tell you when I got involved in this movement when I was about 25 years old, which is way long ago, (laughs) you were always there supporting me and encouraging me and, and just like reminding me how important this work is, even though it's so hard and you're going into your wounds every day. What do you see as your role today in the movement? And what would you like to say to younger people who are coming in behind you and behind me? I do see my role from way back, but especially now, especially in the last 10 years or so, I would say definitely my role is to, number one, be an example to the younger people that you can have a perfectly fabulous life after going through sheer hell that you can go through it, you can come out on the other side. And nine times out of 10, or even 10 on 10, there was never anything diagnostic the matter with you that wasn't, wasn't responding to your environment. Most everybody's, quote, crazy behavior, which I love the word crazy, so expressive, is is very often a completely normal response to whatever is happening in your life at the moment. And so I really, I really want to be an example to other people and, and just be supportive of all the young people. I feel like I have a lot of daughters in this movement. I have a lot of daughters and I have some sons and you're one of my daughters, Leia. Oh yeah. And you're, you're one of my movement mamas. Oh my gosh, it's so moving. Anyway, I I just would say to the people coming along after us, number one, believe in yourself. Don't believe any of those diagnostic labels that were snacked on you because they're not true. And just put one foot in front of the other and know that you will come out on the other side. Even if you're feeling just absolutely dreadful, dreadful, just know that you can do it. Yeah, just give, giving people hope, I think, is a really important thing. And you do that. Every day I see you doing that. And and you uh, are so incredibly active on social media, you know, posting and sharing information, but also supporting folks and, and, and just being that role of, of the movement mama and the, and the supporter and the agitator. You know, I, I just see you in all of those ways. Is there anything else that you would like uh, the listeners to know any stories, anything that you want to share um, kind of by way of closing as you sort of reflect on uh, the incredible work and everything that you continue to contribute to this movement? Well, I don't know. I think I would like to give special thanks to all of my children in this movement, all of my children, because I really love you all. And I also would like to give another special thanks to Bob Whitaker, who I honestly believe, you know, when I first read Mad in America, one of his first books, and I read it and I suddenly saw my story in there and like maybe a paragraph of my story in there. I found him somehow. He was in Cambridge and I found him somehow and I thought I need to have lunch with you. I need to have dinner with you, lunch with you, coffee with you, something. And he he had lunch with me. He could not have been more lovely to me. So he's somebody that I really have always wanted to thank. And I have thanked him. And uh, all of my, just all of my people that I've had to dinner at my house, we had, had group dinners at my house over the years. And I've now decided it's time to pass those dinners on to somebody else because I've been hosting them for like five years or something. And I let some of the people know that I it's time for someone else to take that over. Also, very much appreciate the time I spent at Esplan, which was a donated a two donated weeks for me to spend there with other mental health people, trying to change the system. And I met a lot of new people there that I had never met before. So there's been people, there's been significant people in the movement who have roles in the movement. They were not necessarily uh, survivors in the same way that I'm a survivor. I think the important thing to remember is that most people in this world are survivors of something. And 
our particular situation is unique to us, but many of these people who've given back to people like us have also had their own difficult times to live through. And so I'd like to thank all of them as well. I so appreciate that. And I, um, and I know every single one of them would thank you right back, <laughs> myself included. What I really take away from your story is, is yes, you know, the, the activism is the work that we do to try to change the system and raise awareness or destroy harmful ways of working with people and create something new in their place. And another piece of the activism is even though there's conflict and challenges in every movement, it's how we are with one another, right, in our survivorship. And it's never perfect. But I yeah. hear that in your story that it's like those connections are also our activism, finding yeah. each other, connecting with each other, staying connected. <laughs> how can people who would like to reach you get a hold of you? What are the best ways to do that, whether that's email or social media? Um, do you have your poster up online? It's on my Facebook page. And it's in the Madden America blog. We'll find a, a link just so people can get a little sneak peek. Uh, yeah, of your because poster. There's, it's how I made the poster. It's also two videos, a video of speaking out at, a, at, a, at um, a protest in New York City, and another video of the details of what happened to me. They can also get in touch with me through Facebook Messenger. Great. Fantastic. Well, we will, we'll put that all in the show notes so people can find you and uh, if they want to reach out to you and, and, and learn more yes. about you and what you're doing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. I re- because, I, because as you know, Bernie had a heart attack. Bernie and I are the same age. Bernie Sanders and I are pretty much the same age, 78, maybe 79, but he had a heart attack. And that is what suddenly made me start to think about, oh my God, I have to posters out immediately so my poor children don't find them under my bed. <laughs> they have to figure out what to do with them under my bed. Well, so. you and Bernie are going to you're going to be with us much longer. I insist <laughs> on it. Thank you, honey. Mm, and and thank you so much again. Thank you for being on the podcast and thank you for all you do. You're very welcome. So I'd like to thank Leah and Dorothy for that interview and to say that links to Dorothy's work can be found in the post that accompanies this interview on MaddenAmerica.com. And as always, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit MaddenAmerica.com for more news, views and updates.